Hey, you guys, welcome back to Speak Out. I am your host, Christine Jurgen, and today's episode is something you do not want to miss. I don't say that lightly. I want you to listen to the entire episode, start to finish. It has so much information in it. It's going to be a lot to process. It's heavy at times. It can be gruesome, but we need to hear it because there is a war being waged on our children, and there are people who are trying to sexualize our children and ultimately get them sexually active so that then they're going to Planned Parenthood for more abortions. And today's guest is going to give us a window into this world and how this is done because she lived in this world for over a decade and then she woke up. She she was a comprehensive sex education teacher. She would teach on Title IX. She has been in the classrooms with these kids. She has been in there uh, essentially trying to get them sexually active and said that the, the ways that they teach children is similar to how a predator grooms a child to get them to become sexually active. And this is comprehensive sex ed. This is what they're saying is risk reduction. And these are the things that she's gonna tell us about today. And then she eventually, after being in this world for over a decade, decided, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't think this is actually helping. I think this is actually harming, and this is making children more sexually active, and they don't have to be this way, nor should they be this way. Um, And she became a Christian. She is pro-life now. She founded uh, It Takes a Family, and she goes around and speaks on this and opens the eyes of all of us parents and many other people to what is actually happening in this world. And she is here to tell us all about it. I'm really excited for you guys to hear from her because I could have, when I say I could have talked to her for hours, I could have talked to her probably even longer than that for days and just picked her brain and learn about what she has to say. We had to keep it as brief as possible. It is kind of a longer episode than some of the other ones that we've had, but it is so important, the topic that we're talking about and that you guys listen to all of this. So please listen to it start to finish. Go look up Monica Klein if you have additional questions. She will be happy to take any questions that you have. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. It Takes a Family is her organization, and you guys can contact her. She is absolutely phenomenal. But without any further hesitation, let's go ahead and get into it. Monica, thank you so much for joining us. You have quite the uh, transition story. You have been a comprehensive sex ed teacher trained by Planned Parenthood. Uh, my arch nemesis that you've been trained by uh, LGBTQ. You uh, are now pro-life. You're Christian. You found it. It takes a family that kind of fights all of this stuff. Tell me a little bit about your transition story and how this even came to be. Oh goodness. Well, you know, the transition itself was quite a long process, to be honest. Um, There was a lot of baby steps over 10 years in my 10 year career in comprehensive sex education and family planning. Uh, and a lot of it had to do with becoming a single mom um, or having a child. Uh, it's kind of a longer story. So, but um, but so you know, once I became a single mother, I knew, or a mother really, I knew. I, I just e- immediately became a mama bear. I just knew that I needed to take care of my son, and I, I really let go a lot of the things that I believed in my past, and uh, and really wanted to commit myself to being a very healthy, good, strong mother for my son. Uh, and that was really a, the, the part that, that's what really changed me along with becoming a Christian. Uh, that was part of the path because once I had a child and I wanted to protect that child, I started recognizing that comprehensive sex education being pushed on other people's children was incredibly dangerous. Um, and so it, it was it was a bit of a transition. It took some time. And I really think that it was the Lord who orchestrated that, allowed me to stay in there as long as I did, mostly because I was able to see the inner workings and what the CDC was saying, what Op- Office of Population of Affairs were saying about their view on our families mm-hmm. and children. And, uh, and I think that that helps us a lot in our fight against the sexualization of children and abortion today. Now you got into comprehensive sex education because you thought you were genuinely helping people. Like what was the reason, like, how did you get involved with it in the very beginning? Yeah. So, uh, I was in my twenties and I was just graduating from the university of Texas at Austin. And uh, it was in, I'm showing my age here. Obviously you're on, I'm on video. People can see how old I am, but uh, it was in the nineties and, uh, and HIV. You don't look a day over 20. (laughs) Yeah. Thanks. (laughs) Good liar. So, um, but uh, so anyway, I, you know, that was the time Krista, uh, that, that really we were faced with HIV and that was that was a big mm-hmm. deal for for so many people we knew that it was hitting men who have sex men the hardest as well as women of color 
And I wanted to do my part. I wanted to help. I wanted to protect people. I wanted to prevent the spread of HIV. And, uh, and I wanted to, I, so I started volunteering at a gay organization that had funding to do just that. And, uh, and I was fascinated. I had never seen public health education in that way. I had never seen people just going into the community and talking so openly about sex and, and the prevention of, of the spread of disease. And, um, I, I just thought it was fascinating and, uh, and at the same time to be able to help all these people that others seem to want to help the marginalized. And so, um, I wanted purpose. And so I dove right into it. I was hired within a month of volunteering and, uh, they started the, I was, it was a gay organization. So I was really trained in the gay culture as well. Um, I was trained on sexually transmitted diseases, HIV, and how to prevent the spread. And eventually they said, you need to learn how to share this message with children. And so they sent me across the street to Planned Parenthood. And uh, the director of sex education became my mentor. She was my personal mentor. And she just gave me one-on-one -on -one training on how to share this message with children. And she gave me the, you know, she, she really was strategic. She laid the foundation and, and really wanted me to see the problem from her eyes, from her perspective, which is that girls as young as 10 were coming into the clinic looking for abortions. They had sexually transmitted diseases and in some cases even moving objects from their bodies. Um, it was obviously abusive what was happening to these little girls. I mean, she's mm -hmm. talking about 10 years old. And so that was my response. I said, okay, you're you're convincing me that this is a real problem. There's a, an attack on these young girls. They're way too young to be sexually active. They're obviously being abused. Um, teach me how to teach these girls to stay safe, to not have sex. And she immediately corrected me and said, no, dear, you're not here. We're not here to tell them to not have sex. We're, we're here to teach them how to do it safer. And she let me know that it would be very judgmental of me to tell girls, even as young as 10, that they should abstain from sex. She said that I would lose them because they would feel so judged. They'd never trust me again. Uh, she let me know that they were consenting to sex, that this was their choice and their right. And even if their parents didn't like it, that they were, we were there as educators and Planned Parenthood to help them. Uh, in a, a, a very delicate time in their life when they were sexually active. So she, you know, I'll admit I, I went, I, I obviously agreed with her. Um, I submitted to her teaching. I looked around the office where she was teaching me a, a Planned Parenthood office. And I thought, well, they're funded by the government. They receive title 10 funds. They receive HIV prevention funds and testing funds. They receive funds for HIV from CDC. They get trained by the C. I I mean, they were fully supported by the government. So how could it be wrong? And so I submitted to her authority. I believed her that we needed to help these girls in this way and that abstaining was not actually a, a way to do it, that it was the wrong way to do it. And, um, and so I allowed her to teach me. And one of the first things she taught me was to uh, walk into a room that it, full of kids and to imagine that they've done anything and everything when it comes to sex. And if they haven't, they will. And that it was my job as a sex educator to teach them about every sexual activity and, and teach them how to reduce their risk in those sexual activities, uh, which, which, which really just means using condoms and lubrication. Uh, and then to tell those kids that they need to get tested every three to six months because it's not a matter of if you get infected with the oh disease, but a matter of when and to refer them for abortion. So, um, and that's the cycle. Um, the cycle is you become sexually active, you use condoms, you get tested and treated, you have abortion and you just keep on that cycle of dependency on the Planned Parenthood clinic. Um, and as you and I know, there's a lot of depression um, a lot of suicidal ideation that occurs in, in being involved in these high risk activities, especially when you're a child. So that, that yeah. was, um, it's, go ahead. I was just gonna say, it's infuriating to me. Mm -hmm. I have a, a 14 year old, almost 15 year old. And, um, I, 
I'm embarrassed to say this, but in fifth grade, they had a, a sex education class at school, and I knew the doctor who was teaching it, um, and, and I don't know that he was trained in the same way that you were, but I I didn't ask any questions back then. I just was like, oh, of course, they're not going to do anything that's you know, super problematic. I had my beliefs, you know, my pro-life beliefs, and I didn't want abortion pushed on my kid or anything, but... I thought it was going to be just, you know, kind of what they tell you. Like, they're going to tell you that this is how a baby's made and you probably shouldn't have sex. But to you, or what from what you're saying, is they're basically telling kids it's okay. There's no, like, you guys are too young for this. You shouldn't be participating in this. Obviously, we can't control what children do all of the time. Um, and so, yes, there are some who slip through the cracks and this stuff does happen, but almost teaching them in the way that you were trained to kind of gives them the okay and the green light to continue doing it and says, Hey, what you're doing is okay. Just make sure that you're getting tested along the way, make sure you're using protection along the way. And that's just so enraging to me because a 10 year old has no business doing anything like this. You actually said in one of your speeches, um, and I want you to share this with the listeners that, uh, the steps that you were teaching in the classroom, um, and that they train you guys on and what they're teaching in the classroom today is similar to a predator who's grooming a child to become sexually active. Can you kind of like, tell me the steps that you're supposed to teach them that are similar to groomers and predators? Sure. So the FBI put out a statement of how predators groom children for sexual abuse and uh, it's creating a relationship or or a rapport with a child right really positive and then using language to start breaking down inhibitions so that next step is after creating a relationship you want to break down the inhibitions uh, to talking about sex and so then they start to talk to the children little by little about sex they may show imagery at that point so then they're going to use videos or pictures to then further break down the inhibitions uh, until they're able to then sexually abuse that child physically. And it's very similar to comprehensive sex education. So, you know, one of the things that my mentor at Planned Parenthood uh, taught me is that after recognizing that every child is just put it in your head is what she's telling me, just put it in your head that every child is sexually active and they're doing anything and everything. And she said, now the next thing is that children are not, they are inhibited, she said. So, so which one is it, right? <laughs> so she's saying two different yeah. things here, but she said they are inhibited and they're not going to tell you what they're doing. Um, so this is why she said you just need to teach them everything because they're not going to admit to you what they're doing. So you just have to teach them all, everything, uh, wh which is not, very disingenuous. It's not true that children are doing all those things. Um, but she said in order to start having these conversations with them, you have to break down those inhibitions. And so then she said, um, use this icebreaker. And what's interesting about this icebreaker is that this was taught to me in like 1996, 97. That's um, the same icebreaker that I still hear people using today. It's, it's really weird. So nothing has really changed and other than adding gender ideology to all of this. Um, and so this icebreaker is very simple. Uh, you can have a whiteboard behind you, or you can use post-it notes, but you essentially ask the children to shout out the names, uh, slang names about sex, their body parts. Uh, they can use medical names. They can use slang, whatever it is. It just, they just need to shout it out. And as they're shouting it out, um, I'm writing it on the whiteboard behind me. And so every possible term you could think of. Uh, whether they said vagina or they used a slang term for your vagina or even a very you know, just an ugly term, whatever it is. And it was all written on the back. And so what happens in this, in this process, in this activity is that, you know, you're always going to have at least one or two kids that are kind of rebellious and they're happy to shout out whatever they know. Right. Uh, and then mm -hmm. you're going to have those kids who are kind of shy and stay quiet. But by the end of the activity, as they watch the authority in the room, which is the educator and a young adult or an adult uh, is basically encouraging them to do it. They're not being judged. They're not being told they can't. They're not giving any kind of boundaries. 
So even the quiet kids towards the end are also joining in on the conversation. And even if they're not shouting out those terms, their inhibitions are starting to break down where they seemed uncomfortable at the beginning of the activity. By the end of the activity, they're maybe giggling a little bit. And so it truly is breaking down children's inhibitions, but what it's also doing is it's changing their attitudes, their values, and their beliefs about sex and their bodies and how they should view themselves in one another. So at the end of the activity, they've got this collage of derogatory terms about themselves and about their body parts and about sex. And what it does is it not only breaks down the inhibitions, but it also objectifies them because it's very dehumanizing to think of ourselves in that manner uh, and to call ourselves by, you know, our body parts by those names. So it now dehumanizes the child. But now that their inhibitions are broken down and they understand what this conversation is going to be like, we now go into talking about sexual activity. And so when comprehensive sex education says, well, don't you want kids to know about disease and how to prevent the spread of disease? And parents were like, well, yes. <laughs> the public's like, well, yes, we don't want that. But what that really looks like is that we're going to talk about anal sex, vaginal sex, oral sex, semen, blood, and vaginal secretions. And we're going to talk about all the possible ways that those can be exchanged. So then, so what you're really talking about when you talk about disease prevention is talking about every possible sexual activity whether it's two people together, the same sex together, three people, four people, the use of sex toys. Um, how do you use condoms? Cause you're not supposed to use a condom with the same person and, a, and the next person and the next person you have to change it. So literally going into detail on how you can have sex with either one or multiple at the same time, sex toys or no sex toys every possible sexual activity. So that becomes the conversation about disease. Because yes, I'm going to tell you that HIV is spread through blood and vaginal secretions and semen, but now I have to give you all the possible scenarios how those fluids could be exchanged between people. So it's incredibly graphic. And what it's also doing is teaching children that this is acceptable behavior, that's that high risk sexual behavior is normal and it's expected of them. Um, and, and so what happens if we pull away from this is not only have we taught children, we've sexualized them, we've taught them how to objectify themselves and each other. And as they're going through that process of doing that, as they start becoming sexually active, it's the natural next step to dehumanize the preborn child. So if you're, you've been in, in relationships where you're just dehumanizing each other and sex is not about love or relationships or marriage, but it's all about sexual pleasure, then it's, it's a natural next step to dehumanize that child. And it really becomes just like one thing after the other. So when, so in other words, become sexually active, use condoms and lubrication, get tested, get treated, have an abortion. It's literally a cycle. And so when some people say, how do people not understand that it's actually a baby? Because these children are being taught not to think of pregnancy or a baby. They're just taught to think about that cycle, be sexually active, use condoms and lubrication, get tested, get treated, have an abortion. It's just next step. And so you're not taught to humanize yourself or that preborn child. You're actually taught to dehumanize yourself and the preborn child. And it becomes this cycle. And so then we wonder why children are having, um, why we're seeing so much depression and suicidal ideation because we're convincing our children. And, and this isn't the only thing that's, that's really affecting children's, you know, emotional state. Um, but if we're, if we're really encouraging our children through this form of sex education, which is really sexualizing children, then it's no wonder that these children are experiencing the the depression, having difficulty, having relationships, friendships, succeeding in school, because we've encouraged them through this type of government funded sex education to dehumanize themselves, to engage in high risk sexual activity. And, and this kind of sex education also normalizes all of that. So they're basically saying it's normal for children to have sex in childhood. 
It's normal to get a disease. Don't feel ashamed. Just go get treated for it. It's normal to have an abortion. Don't feel bad or ashamed of it. It's just part of reproductive health. So they're, they're taking all that is depraved and unhealthy and dangerous and calling it normal. Uh, they're saying normal, where the CDC right? says, uh, Christine, that STDs are at epidemic levels for ages 15 to 24. They comprehensive sex education, Planned Parenthood will say STDs are normal. It's not, it's not that it's an epidemic. It's just normal. Just expect disease when you become sexually active. Right. Common and doesn't mean normal. Exactly. Exactly. Common doesn't mean, mean normal, but we are seeing that even as they're training up peer educators and a peer educator means that it's a child that they're training to talk about this type of um, sex education and those children then teach other children. Those peer educators, literally minors teaching other minors about sex in the graphic way that I just explained it to you. And we're seeing, you know, there's this one photo that I have of a, a young man who identifies as a homosexual male. He's just a teenager in Massachusetts. And he posted on Instagram a very um, kind of sexual picture of himself uh, basically saying i want everyone to know that stds are normal uh so here we see what? that they're speaking no. it it's not just me it's not just you know monica klein saying that they're doing it no they're saying it they're telling people that it's normal yeah. it's almost like they need affirmation to just do have a free-for-all just you know, we're, we're going to allow abortions. We're going to allow STDs. We want to be able to have sex with whoever we want, whenever we want. And so we're just not, we're just going to keep affirming what we do. So we feel good about it when really, you know, they go home and we know that they're not feeling good about it. Nobody does. Um, I want to go a little bit back. So basically what you're saying in the comprehensive sex ed, you have 10 year olds who maybe, maybe they've kissed a guy, uh, like maybe a little 10 year old girl, maybe she's kissed a little boy or even just thought about kissing a little boy and then you throw her into this class and she's taught about anal sex she's taught taught about orgies and all of these disease like she may not have even known what an orgy was or that you can have threesomes or anything along those lines and all of a sudden this 10 year old who's just thought about kissing a boy or maybe like given a peck on the playground is thrown into this world that hey all of this stuff is normal and you should be doing it that's what it sounds like to me is that these kids are being told that you should be doing this if you're not doing it you're not normal maybe there's another kid in the class who is doing it so then they feel pressure to do it and that's something interesting when i was in high school um just like a brief little story there was a girl who slept around a lot we'll just say that she was very sexually active and i wasn't and she told me, um, I wish you would hurry up and do something with, uh, with a boy because you're making me feel, she used the word slut. You're making me feel like a slut. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine being like a 10 year old girl or 12 year old girl and hearing those, you know, I was old enough to be like, okay, well you, you're making those decisions on your own. You do you, um, that's not going to pressure me to do anything. And even as a high schooler, we're very impressionable. But I can't imagine uh, a preteen hearing that and, and seeing that other kids are doing it. And now there's this adult teacher who's supposed to have authority and supposed to speak into their life as things are as if things are factual and true, hearing this stuff and thinking, oh, this is what people do. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. That is, I, I know I used the word enraging earlier, but it's, it's infuriating. I, I, we're supposed to protect kids. And as parents, that's why I want, I want parents to listen to this. And guys, if you are listening to this and you're not a parent, you still need to listen to it, but send it to every parent that you know, because these are things that we need to hear because we need to know how bad it is in comprehensive sex education. Would you say that comprehensive sex ed today is worse than it was when you were involved? I feel like they're not hiding anything anymore. Now it's just like, yeah, sex is totally normal when before when you were there, uh, or at least when I was in school, maybe they, it was a little more under wraps and hush hush about what they talked about it. Now it seems to be just a free for all. And if you're opposed to any of it, you're some sort of a bigot. Um, comprehensive sex education hasn't changed very much since I, since I taught it in the nineties, uh, and into two thousands. It, what's different today is that there's more gender ideology than before. 
we were taught to always use gender neutral language, but that was because we were working under the assumption that we possibly had gay youth in our groups and we didn't want to only talk about heterosexual sex. And um, that, and really what that really did was it gave all the children the idea that it was normal or that it was uh, acceptable to experiment with homosexuality. So not only did we normalize anal sex and all the other things, but now we're also telling them by using gender neutral language that, you know, you might have oral sex with a girl and I'm talking to girls, you know, so uh, all of that was was being pushed sexual orientation and experimenting with uh, with homosexuality was a, a part of that. Gender ideology, though, believing that your gender is fluid and not binary was not something that we talked about back then. Um, and even with the homosexual community, the whole trans thing was something that was never really a part of the LGBTQ, even though the T was always there. There was always conversations about how, like, mm, they're just really different. <laughs> so they really didn't associate yeah. with each other that much except for drag queens. And that was mostly at fundraisers. But... Um, you know, you mentioned the thing about families and, and this is, I want to, I want to pull back to that a little bit because when I, when I first left comprehensive sex education, I did sit at home and I was a Christian at that time. And I thought, Lord, how was I deceived? Show me what, what did they do to, to deceive me so that I can help others? And a big part of it was that Planned Parenthood, um, he reminded me that Planned Parenthood always said that parents were a barrier to service. Parents were a barrier to the services that they provided to children. And so they did everything possible to keep parents out of the picture. And so that's the thing I want your listeners to understand. And this is why I started It Takes a Family, is that there is, I think that the bigger, the bigger goal here is to destroy God's creation of humanity God's creation and purpose for marriage, our identities um, as parents, our roles as parents, and the role of children who are under the authority of the parent. And so we see God's biblical order of the family, and we see God, and then we see husband, and then we see wife, and then we see children. And we don't, um, and, and no, if you're not watching the video, uh, you'll see that I'm, I'm being linear about that. It's not God, and then there's husband and wife over branching out to the sides. No, it's linear. Mm -hmm. It is God, husband, wife, and children are directly underneath that, the parent's protection. And what's happening with our government and with our culture today is that they're trying to treat children as being an arm away from the parents, that people and government, the state, the culture can, can now intervene and replace the parent and have access to our children. And parents, I think in many ways, are, are allowing it to happen. Uh, when we allow our children to be taught by the culture or by the public school system, we are allowing to give up our own authority so that they can now teach our children. And we need to stop that as parents. And so this is, you know, there, much of what Planned Parenthood and many organizations are saying is that parents don't speak to their kids. Parents won't speak to their kids. Parents are uneducated. They don't know what to say. So we need to say it for them. We need to get to the, ki to the children ourselves because parents aren't doing it. And when you do that, you are taking children out from underneath the order that God placed them in and you need to stop doing mm -hmm. it. So I even say that to youth pastors, youth pastors, you have no business talking to kids about sex. That's not your role. It is the role of the parent. And so what we need to be doing yep. is educating yep. our parents and whether you're not a parent now, or you are a parent, you need to understand what your role as a parent is to your child and maintain that authority. It is a God-given stewardship, and you need to take that very seriously. But also going back, Christine, to what you mentioned earlier about these children and that this kind of education gives them this expectation that this is what you're supposed to be doing. This is life. Get sexually active and do all these things. And I'll illustrate as well with the story is Planned Parenthood asked me to go speak to some kids about 13 years old, 13, 14 years old at an alternative school. Uh, and so these are high risk children already. They've been kicked out of other schools. So they're pretty, you know, rambunctious. And so I go and I teach yeah. them and I'm giving them the usual spiel. I'm writing on the board, oral sex, anal sex, vaginal sex, and on the other side, blood, vaginal secretions and, and semen, which carry those, you know, diseases. And so 
that's already on the whiteboard. We're having the conversation about sex and, and how it's, how diseases are transmitted. And this 13 year old girl raises her hand and I have boys and girls in this class and, um, and I'll clean up her language cause I know this is going out, you know, on a podcast, but she said, um, when I'm involved in this sexual ac activity, I gag, can you teach me how to do it better? And I was, I, I'll admit, I mean, I, I had, I talked about all kinds of sex with all kinds of people. I did outreach on the street with prostitutes, IV drug users. I had heard everything possible, but watching and listening this, to this little girl, 13 years old, ask that kind of a question so seriously, because she wasn't trying to make anyone laugh. It really made my heart break. And so I, I repeated her question to her because I wanted her to fully understand what she was saying and asking and understand. I wanted her to understand what she was really even thinking and feeling about this situation. I said, well, it sounds like when you're involved in this activity, you have this reaction and you don't, it sounds like you don't like that reaction. She said, I don't, you're right. I, I don't like this reaction. So can you teach me how to do it better so that I don't have that reaction? And I said, well, have you ever considered just not doing the thing that you don't like to do? If you don't like yeah. it, you don't have to do it. And those kids, you know, Planned Parenthood had taught me that if I told them not to have sex, that they're going to feel judged, they're going to shut down. But those kids all turned and straightened in their seats and gave me their full attention. And they were just kind of wide eyed. And I said, guys, do you realize that you don't have to have sex? And I pointed at the board and I said, you don't have to have anal sex, oral sex, or vaginal sex. And if you don't, you'll never be in contact with these, you know, bodily fluids. And if you're not exchanging bodily fluids, then you're not going to have disease and you don't have to worry about pregnancy. And the same little girl raised her hand again. And she said, ma'am, no one's ever told us that. And, and it's because comprehensive sex education has become so pervasive. It is what is funded by the government. It is what is being pushed from HIV funding, STD funding, family planning, all of these different forms of funding are teaching the same kind of sex education. And it's giving our children this expectation or this belief that sex is expected of them. And sex in childhood is considered high risk. That's why we're seeing so much disease in that age range, because it is high risk. It's high risk for disease, depression, suicidal ideation, sexual violence. The best thing for any child, regardless of how they identify, is to avoid sexual activity in childhood. And that Absolutely. is the message that we need to be giving all of our children, no matter where they are in life, socioeconomic status, orientation, children need to be protected from sexual activity at that age. Amen. It is what will keep Amen. them safe. But really comprehensive sex education, I theorize, and I'm not the only one that has this theory, the more we sexualize our children in the classroom, considering it quote unquote safe because it's in the classroom, it's also giving children the message that it's okay for adults to talk to them in such provocative ways. That's so, something I always say. Yes. So you have a stranger coming into the classroom, yeah. talking to these kids about sex and you're normalizing these kids, then going to talk to people they don't know exactly. about sex. There's so, nothing normal about a child talking to a stranger about sex. Exactly. So now when the predator comes, whether it's online or in their neighborhood, they will not be able to discern that this is wrong. Because if my teachers are teaching me this in the classroom and cheering me on, then why is it wrong for the stranger to talk to me, whether it's at church, in my neighborhood, online, it all becomes normalized and it puts them at even greater risk of being trafficked. Because now our children have lost that discernment. There's no boundaries anymore. Yeah. And it, it, so it puts our children at great risk on so many different levels. I think the other deception is, well, Monica, we hear that we need comprehensive sex education in order to be inclusive of the homosexual kids or LGBTQ kids. I think I've kind of addressed that a little bit in what we're talking about, but 
The CDC does say that children who identify with LGBTQ are at greater risk than their heterosexual peers for disease, not using condoms, and sexual violence. But, and what I know of, of the homosexual Why is that? community. Well, uh, I think this is how I'll, I'll address that. When I worked in, with the gay organization and in comprehensive sex ed, and, and all comprehensive sex ed, we are always surrounded by the homosexual community. All of the teen groups that I visited, sponsored by inclusive organizations, always welcomed the students as soon as they walked in with a fishbowl full of condoms, a fishbowl full of lubrication, and catalogs to good vibrations, which is sex toys. The children who go to these LGBTQ clubs are highly sexualized by the people running those groups because their identity is in who they're having sex with. So if you're not having sex, then, you know, it, it's, it's very strange. And so basically these children are highly sexualized. And so they're putting themselves in at great risk. And I believe that that's a big part of it as well. And so my message to those families uh, as well, or to any family in a school, is that even that it, that, that data just shows us that that even those children, those children also deserve to be protected from sexualization and that they should Absolutely. also be given the message to avoid sex in childhood, to keep them safe. Um, so inclusivity just means setting the bar low and sexualizing all children. And I say, absolutely not. We need to protect our children, regardless of how they're identifying, regardless of their situation, every child deserves to be protected and not sexualized. Absolutely. It, it's bizarre to me that when you, when it does come to the LGBTQ movement, it, you're considered hateful. If you think that those children too should be protected, it's like, no, just because they might be attracted to somebody different doesn't mean that it's okay to now then sexualize them. Like all, all children are worthy of protection and it's our job as parents to protect these children. I say, we are our children's only with the exception of God. We are our children's only line of defense here. We That's are right. the ones who are supposed to be protecting them. Now, comprehensive sex ed as parents, we're told if you don't want your teen to get pregnant, you need to send them to comprehensive sex ed. They say that comprehensive sex ed prevents teen pregnancies, but I've also read studies which are not here in the United States. Interestingly, they're in other countries that um, actually produce these studies that comprehensive sex ed increases teen pregnancy. Do, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, you know, actually just even here in Texas, we have, uh, and, ac and across the nation, the teen pregnancy prevention programs. Uh, you look at the studies and I've downloaded as many of them as I can, and, and they're not very long studies, to be honest. And I've downloaded them because I believe that one day they're going to try to get rid of them. So you don't see them. I was just going to say that. Yeah. Um, yeah, they show either null effect, meaning they couldn't tell whether it helped or didn't help, uh, adverse effects meaning that they actually increase sexual activity among the teens. Mm -hmm. um, and so what they're, what's interesting is that it's the teen pregnancy prevention program. So you would think that in the research, they would be getting information about whether teens got pregnant or not and, and comparing numbers of like, were there less pregnancies versus after our program, we had less pregnancies. They're not even looking at pregnancy. The only thing they looked at was condom use. They didn't look at whether the kids got diseases and they didn't look at whether kids, whether the girls got wow. pregnant or not. They only looked at condom use. And that is exactly the same thing with HIV, STD, and these pregnancy prevention programs is that their, their only objective that they can sort of evaluate is, are you using condoms and are you using them consistently? And mm -hmm. the only way you can get that information is by self-report. And any good researcher will tell you that self-report is not a strong study. Um, the other reason that this, it, I mean, because people may not tell you the truth. Um, the other reason is because unless you have a captive audience, you don't know if those people that you taught are going to come back for the post-evaluation six months or even a year later. 
so even with HIV, um, I went to the CDC and was trained on the evidence-based interventions so that I could bring back my evidence-based interventions for my programs. Um, and I asked them, how do you know that these are successful programs? What makes them evidence-based? And they said, self-report. <laughs> and I was mm. like, seriously, that's it? Because I knew my population and they would tell me whatever I wanted them to hear, you know, whatever they yeah. thought I wanted to hear is what I'm trying to say. It did, it, they didn't have to be truthful. And the truth is, is that when we did these assessments, we had to pay them to do it. We had to, you know, incentivize them to even come in with $50, $100 gift cards, you know, so these are very weak studies. Uh, and really what we're seeing is look at the STD rates, look at the HIV rates in any given zip code. Are you seeing that things have actually changed or improved? And the answer is no. Uh, this yeah. form of sex education, this intervention risk reduction is not working, not for children and not for adults. But what we're really seeing is, and what God helped me see is that what I'm seeing is really the destruction of children and the destruction of family in all these communities. That's what it really did because it, it just, the way, what I usually say is what I was taught is meet them where they're at, uh, and, and then give them this risk reduction information. Right. Uh, so a lot of times Planned Parenthood, many of these organizations say we have to meet people where they're at and this is where they're at, you know? And, and so apparently that's a good thing to do. So you meet them where they're at, but all you do is give them condoms and lubrication with this false belief that they're going to be safe, but really they're in this cycle of deprivation. Um, but really what God offers us is he, for me, for example, you know, um, I, I didn't just teach this Christine. I, I lived it. I lived it out in my own life as well, but God met me where I was at and he didn't leave me there. He took me to a new place. He got me out of it to a safer yeah. place, to a place where I learned my value. And so that's what we need to be doing for our kids and for our families is, yes, we meet them where they're at. We love them where they're at, but we don't leave them there. We take them out of high risk activity. We encourage them out. We show them a new way. We give them hope. We give them life. Um, but these programs are to meet people where they're at and leave them there in high risk activity or even introduce them to more high risk activities. Which is so interesting because this is something I say exactly about Planned Parenthood when it comes to abortion, when they have a woman who comes in and says, hey, you know, I, I don't know how I'm going to pay rent next month. Um, I'm scared. I don't know what to do. And they say, well, here's an abortion. And guess what? You still don't know how you're going to pay rent next month. Whereas the pro-life movement comes in and says, let us help you. We can help cover rent for you for a little while. If that's what you need, we can help you find uh, rental as uh, renting assistance or housing assistance. Uh, here's all of these resources. Do you also need groceries? What about your utilities? Are your util utilities okay? What do you need for the baby and what can we do for you? But Planned Parenthood just says, oh, that's a really crappy situation you're in. Here, let's kill your baby and go back to this crappy situation. It's there's nothing pro woman about it, and it's bizarre to me that they even like pretend that they're pro woman. There's something else another woman said, and I cannot even remember her name. And I think she taught comprehensive sex ed, or maybe she was, she might have been a former abortionist. Now that I'm thinking of it, I'm gonna look it up and then I'll try to link it in the um, in the description for the video and the podcast episode. But she said it was. Um, their goal to become the sexpert in kids' lives, she called it the sexpert, which sounds very much like what you're saying, and that their goal was also to have a young woman come in for multiple abortions by the time she's, you know, in her early 20s. Is that something that you saw happen too, that they were um, using this as a way to profit off of these children, essentially? Because obviously Planned Parenthood's profiting off of abortions. How do we expect them to prevent teen pregnancy when this is their moneymaker? Yeah. You know, when I finally started changing, uh, the way I thought and, um, and really it was because I, I became a Christian and I started to see with God's eyes instead of, instead of my own eyes. Um, I, I had a woman come in as well who for with, uh, to fill out my assessment for this evidence-based intervention. And it was really just to convince them, you know, the program is just start using condoms and use them consistently. And this woman sat in front of me and, and so the assessment was, do you use condoms? And if not, why not? You know, so that I could try to implement behavior change models to help her use condoms. And she said, um, if I, I get paid more not to use condoms, uh, so she was a prostitute. Um, mm -hmm. if I have one child to get food stamps, if I have two children, I get a place to live. 
So again, going back to conversation about this woman was actually, you know, she had other needs. She had a lot of needs and problems in her life. And I realized here I am in this organization, well-funded by the CDC. And I have in front of me a woman who is in desperate need of someone to come into her life and help her. And all I have to offer her through this program is, hey, why don't you just start using some condoms? Right. Uh, and I realized she needed Christ. And it's true that, and that's when I started realizing that these programs are actually destroying the families and the communities that they say that they're serving. Um, the, the, your question about, is it increasing abortions? And do they know that they're doing that? Absolutely. So when I started questioning what we were doing, these were all people that I had, I say, had grown up with. I met them right out of college. They became my mentors or they were women who were my age and we were just growing up together and mentored by the same people. And I started questioning it. And especially because I was a single mom, I had chosen life for my son. And I said, guys, you know, do you realize that we really do promote abortion? And they're like, Monica, what are you talking about? Like they were just, they didn't understand why I was questioning that. And um, I, I pointed out, I said, you know, when we have these family planning conferences, whether it's in, you know, whatever, this, they're always statewide conferences. I said, we've had people, we've had or adoption agencies wanting to come to our conferences to set up a booth and talk about adoption. And we can't deny them, but nobody wants them. We don't seek them out. We get upset that they even want to come. Everyone wow. ignores those adoption agencies when they do have a booth. You know, we are against adoption, but we're very pro-abortion. That's all we talk about. And they were very confused by me because they didn't understand why I was changing my position. And the more I questioned sex education, family planning services, our push for abortion, my supervisor eventually did tell me, if you're not pro-choice, you don't belong here. And what that's what's interesting is that I was funded by Title X, and Title X is family planning funds, and it does not allow you to refer or provide abortions with that money. But here she was supervising all of our Title X training managers, and she's telling me for a grant that does not promote or refer to abortion that I still needed to be pro-choice because they were wow. referring to abortions and because Planned Parenthood was providing abortions even though they were receiving that funding. And so the family planning world is very much a pro-abortion um, institution. It's so interesting uh, they call it family planning. It just... they Yeah, yeah, the family the planning, Planned use. Parenthood, right. Um, you know, just like the Respect for Marriage Act today. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, not no about kidding. respect for marriage at all. Uh, twisting the truth, twisting the words. Um, so it's very much about promoting abortion. It is a considered an essential right. Um, so when they're teaching children, it's very much that children have sexual rights. You see that in their standards, the National Sex Education Standards. You see that in um, International Planned Parenthood Federation and across the globe that children have sexual rights. Uh, what that means is that when we talk about human rights, there has to be an oppressor. And so who is the oppressor of children who would possibly get in their way from their sexual rights or from becoming sexually active? Usually that's the parent. So they're literally setting Mom up parents to be the oppressor of children wow who want to be sexually yeah. active. And it's not true that children are just, you know, ready to become sexually active. Are they curious? Yes. And that's where I do education with parents as well. We don't have to be afraid of this, of talking about sex. Uh, it's okay that our children are curious. It's okay that their bodies are changing. Uh, what I told my son is congratulations, your body is developing, your brain is developing exactly as God intended it to. So you're curious. So you're you know, your body's changing, you're responding, you're all kinds of things. Let's talk about ways you can stay healthy and be okay with all of this. You know, so puberty is totally normal, not a big deal. Um, but it's something that parents need to be talking to their children. And there is no sex talk. There is no one talk. It is something that you need to be talking to your children, even when they're very young. And I'm not talking about sex and the sex talk itself, but helping them understand who they are, talking about privacy, boundaries, healthy boundaries, um, teaching them about marriage. 
I mean, you can't talk to your children about sexual activity until you first teach them about marriage because sexual activity is created to be part of marriage. So until you teach your children that marriage is between one man, one woman, um, you know, and the roles of a husband and a wife, then you can't really have the sex talk yet. So right. really, it is teaching children about the role of, of the family, the role of marriage, the role of a husband and wife, and, and you can emulate that within your own, you know, use your own family as an example. I did it as a single mom. I still taught my son what marriage, as God designed it, was supposed to look like. And I, I you know, pointed out, obviously, you and I are a single family, you know, single parent family. So one day God will bless us with a stepdad or a husband for me, or maybe not, but either way, you know, God is my husband. God is over us. He's over mm -hmm. our family. Um, but I still taught him what a marriage looked like according to God's design. And then it didn't, it made sense when we finally had the sex talk, because now he understood that that was something that, that belonged within the marriage and not separate from marriage. So, um, it is a lifelong conversation with our kids. And, and I tell people, this is that you don't want it to be some class that you go to. Because if, if you hire me to teach your kids about sex, it's such an intimate thing. And there's so many questions throughout their lives. They're not going to have me their whole lives. It doesn't make sense for them to talk to me about it, but it makes sense for them to talk to their parents about it. Because Absolutely. then whether it's in five years, 10 years, or 20 years, you know, you can go to your parent to talk about something. Yeah, It's okay if point. you don't always have all the answers right away. Um, it, you're a human and you're not perfect. And it, that's really good for your, your kids to see that we might have to research together and that's okay, but it's best to have it with, within the family and it protects the kids because what I taught my son is we're having these conversations about privacy, like in elementary school and that you have private parts and that no one should look or touch, talk to you about your private parts. Cause that's a red flag. Uh, so that meant and I taught my son, no one at school, no teacher, nobody should be talking to you about private parts because that's just part of safety. And so mm -hmm. he understood that if any adult talked to him or anything about private parts, then he knew that that was a problem and that was an unsafe situation and he needed to come back and report that to me. Right. You know, so that was all part of, I believe is part of that sex talk as well as boundaries. Um, so if I'm teaching my son that no other adult should talk to him about these things, then he knows that he's not going to get sex ed in the school because we're doing it at home. Absolutely. I want to share, especially for the parents listening who are like, oh my gosh, I, my kid might've been in one of these classes or they're trying to push this at my kid's school. Some of the curriculum titles that parents should know, um, and they all sound very good. Like we said, they, they're good at yeah. words. They're good at making things sound good. Um, reducing the risk is the name of one of these curriculums, safer choices, draw the line or respect the line. It's sometimes called be proud, be responsible, making proud choices, uh, promoting health among teens. I mean, when you're as a parent, when you hear like promoting health among teens, you're like, yeah, I want, I want health for my teenager. Um, but really they, they sound good and they're, they're actually harming our kids. And it, it includes all of this stuff that you're talking about. And I've been told by many people that Planned Parenthood is actually behind a lot of these curriculums, but they give them different names because when parents hear the word Planned Parenthood, their radars kind of go off, which is confirmed by what you said, that parents are a barrier to service. Um, they don't want us to know that Planned Parenthood is pushing a lot of this stuff. So they give it these different names. Can you give me, since you were just talking about talking to your son, give me maybe a very brief, uh, couple of tips on, or, or how you would talk to somebody maybe 12, 13 years old about what's an age appropriate way to talk about sex to a, a preteen or somebody who's just coming into their teenage years. Sure. Sure. Before I answer that though, you're bringing up a good point about those curricula. And the way parents can identify whether it's a good one or a bad one is, does it align with the national sex education standards? Any comprehensive sex education curriculum is very proud to say that they align with the national sex education standards. Get familiar with those standards. You can find them on SECUS or Advocates for Youth, both terrible organizations. But those, <laughs> those are the standards that they're using in our country, very similar to what they're using across the globe. 
And, the, you, and when you read those standards, you will be able to identify and discern whether the program that's come, that's being proposed for your school or is in your school is uh, a bad one or a good one. Uh, in my opinion, I don't believe that sex education belongs in the school whatsoever. Uh, because even in this, yeah, not even, not even sexual risk avoidance, which is the abstinence programs, because they're still going to need to, um, fulfill some of the standards of your state. And so if your state says that you need to talk about STDs, HIV, then they're still going to talk about how they're transmitted anally, orally, all of it. Mm -hmm. So I really believe that these kind of issues, social issues, the sex education does not belong in the public school whatsoever. But if you are trying to discern what is comprehensive sex ed, what is risk avoidance, national sex education standards usually is what you need to be looking for. Even Goodhart Wilcox is a health textbook publisher uh, that is being used across our country. They align with the national sex education standards, and that's just a health book. That's not even sex education. That's just the health book, but they have all of the national sex education standards within their health text. They talk about pregnant people instead of pregnant women. Uh, they talk about uh, um, humanity, uh, human development begins at birth, not oh at gosh. fertilization. Yeah. So Goodhart Wilcox, Lots of science publisher. There. Yeah. A lot, yeah. Anti-science. So there's a lot of things in there that you need to be worried about. Now, how do you talk to your teen or preteen about their bodies? Um, I, I'm a very relational person. And so I also recognize that kids are at completely different levels. You know, um, some are, are asking really intimate questions in elementary school, which is su surprising to me because <laughs> my son wasn't like that. Um, and, and other kids, you know, they just don't want to talk about it. And so... When my son was really young, you know, I stuck to the science really, you know, he asked in elementary school, how are babies made? And I'm like, oh, it's, you know, it's, it, let me tell you the science. And I talk about how men have sperm and women have an egg. And when it comes together, it has this, you know, reaction and it starts to grow and, you know, and he's like, oh, okay, great. And he moved on mm -hmm. <laughs> we, and eventually, you know, he got older and said, well, how does the egg and the, and the sperm come together? Okay. Yeah. You know, so then we, right. we started talking about, you know, more, um, once we actually got to the point that it was time to, you know, he needed to know more. Uh, I did tell him, I said, I'm going to answer your question as best as I believe you need to know at your age. And I just, just kind of discerned that myself, to be honest. I said, at any moment, if you're uncomfortable with what I'm saying, hold your hand up and let me know that's enough. I'm not going to ask you why or what it's just, as, as long as you say that's enough, I will stop and we can move on and do whatever else. And at least three times in his life, he did say that's enough. Yeah. And it wasn't even graphic what I was saying, but it was enough for him. Mm -hmm. Like, no, you're not going to get that if you're allowing your child to be educated outside of your home by yep. someone else, Yep. because the, all the kids are going to get the same thing at the same time and no one's going to stop. They're going to finish whatever the lesson is, but in your home, you get to go at your child's pace and only, you know, your child best. And so you can use that. Um, when he finally, we finally had the conversation probably about fifth grade, the actual sex act, his face was just like, he was so disgusted by the thought of that. So I quickly stopped the conversation. I said, okay, we just talked about the physical part of it but let's talk about what marriage really is and mm -hmm. what, you know, and so then we really talked about God's design for man and how he is to give his life to his wife as Jesus gave his life to the church. Um, we talked about those roles. We talked about how um, a husband and a wife are each other's best friends that no one else in the world will know that person the way you know that person. Like it's just so special. And at some point he looked at me, he said, mom, that sounds amazing. And that's real sexual intimacy. That's yeah. real intimacy between a husband and a wife. It's not the act. And so I realized at that moment that he did learn the act and that's okay. It's biology. It's okay. It's science, right? It, it is the act. But I emphasize that this is what, what it really means. This is what it, what sexual intimacy is really about. 
And it's about this marriage. It's about this relationship. It's about something that's so special. No one else can experience but the two of you. And he understood that. And that meant more to him than just talking about the act. Um, you know, and as he got older, we had more conversations. Um, I really allowed him to set that pace. And, um, and I, it may be that for some kids, you have to talk about more sooner than later. Um, my son didn't even ask me about the controversy behind anal sex until after he graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it, again, I think it really goes by parent what, what you know your child needs at, at what moment. I think it might be different for a child who's been sexually abused. Um, they might need to know more or they might need to know a lot less. Um, a lot of people who've been abused sexually as children, uh, PTSD tends to be triggered just by puberty uh, wow. because their bodies are changing and all of a sudden they're having this emotional response because of the trauma that they experienced when they were little. So now imagine if they were exposed to sex education. So again, it's something that you have to, um, and, and I'm happy to coach people uh, because I really believe that there isn't any one curriculum that can really teach you everything. I think what I could probably, the best advice I could give to parents that has to do with what can I read is just learn the biology of things, you know, help them to understand, you know, what, um, you know, I hesitate to say this on your podcast, but learn the anatomy of both the boys and the girls. Yeah. Uh, moms don't be afraid, um, to answer your son's questions. Uh, many times boys are going to ask their moms their questions because they spend more time with mom mm -hmm. or they have more conversations with mom and they have that kind of confidence with their moms. It's okay for mom to answer those questions, but make sure you let dad know that you've had that conversation so that he can now have a conversation with the son as well. Um, so, you know, I've had some moms say I refuse to answer his question because I thought only his dad could you know, whatever your family dynamics, but I will say this is that I've had more moms tell me that their sons were greatly disappointed that mom wouldn't just answer their question. And I think it's important that you do if you're comfortable with it, because it, 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 it says that he can have those conversations with you, with a woman and that that's okay. Uh, it doesn't have to be graphic. Um, what Planned Parenthood teaches is not what we're supposed to be teaching our kids. It's completely different. Yeah. Um, but I'm happy to coach anyone who needs that. They can contact me through my website at any time. I don't know if that answered your question or if you have something more specific. No. Yeah. Yeah, it did in a lot of ways. And actually you, the, I think the hand raising of, if, if this gets uncomfortable, um, like, let me know that way you can know if you're going too far, whereas like obviously in comprehensive sex ed, they just go as far as they could possibly go. Um, I, I, I could talk to you probably for hours and hours. This is so interesting to me. It's so heartbreaking in so many ways, but I'm so glad that you had the shift and the, the awakening. And so that now you can educate all of us. I always end each podcast with a question. I want to know from you because this shift was a big one. And I'm sure you had a lot of uh, pushback and a lot of people who hated you for making this shift. If you could give one piece of advice to those who are maybe a little bit nervous to speak out on their pro-life beliefs, on what they've learned now on this podcast with Comprehensive Sex Ed, one piece of advice to encourage them to speak out, what would that be? When you're, you know, when you're speaking truth and love and know what your motivation is, even if the person in front of you gets angry, know that that seed has been planted and you have built and you have planted and that's good. I know in the, in the book of Jeremiah, he talks about, um, where God tells him, you know, you're going to, you're going to go, I'm going to give you the words and you're going to go out and speak, but do not be dismayed by their faces or I will dismay you. <laughs> and he's like, and he's mm -hmm. telling, I want you to, you know, overthrow. I want you to pluck up and throw down. He also said, I want you to build and to plant. And so in the pro-life movement or in, or in a pro family movement, even, speak that truth in love because I used to be that person who hated to hear the truth, but those seeds were planted and they did grow and I was converted. And so no matter what their reaction, always share the truth in love, check your motivation, make sure you're saying this out of love and not to just to win the conversation. Um, because Absolutely. whether it's an adult or a child, <clears throat> the truth is, is we are hurting inside. It is true 
that um, I would go out there and say, I'm proud to do this and be sexually active the way I was, but then I'd go home and I would be depressed about it. And the only thing that gave me comfort in that time was the, the words that Planned Parenthood spoke to me is like, that's all right, girl, you're, you're powerful, you're independent. And I'm like, okay, okay. And then I would do it again and I'd get depressed again. It wasn't until I caught out of it completely that I realized that true power, true freedom and, you know, true um, independence and, and, and beauty was really found in Christ and in abstaining and making that choice. So always speak that truth and love to people. Absolutely. I think that's such a great piece of advice. And I was just kidding. I said that was the last question, but as you were talking, I was thinking of one other thing that I forgot to ask. Um, when it comes to the dehumanization of children, obviously we're dehumanizing babies to make women think that abortion is okay or that it's normal. There was a video um, that I think it was a Planned Parenthood video actually, and they show it in some sex ed classes. And it was just saying that a baby at 12 weeks was just this tiny little blob that comes down the uterus during an abortion. And they don't tell you, do they teach kids in comprehensive sex ed the biology of a baby and how fast a baby grows? No, absolutely not. Just Nothing. like Goodhart Wilcox in a health textbook doesn't talk about the fetus at all or about fetal development at all, or fertilization. Um, no, there is no conversation about that. It's whatsoever. just the contents of pregnancy. Right. It, um, and not even that. There's uh, When we are talking about comprehensive sex ed, it's literally a sex ed 101, um, and it's become today even more about kink and all kinds of crazy things. They don't talk about pregnancy, family at all, except for it's your reproductive right to have an abortion. And this is why that cycle is so powerful because it doesn't teach the child to think, it only teaches the child to act. And not just children, but even adults, because we're seeing adults doing the same thing. You have sex, use condoms, get tested, get treated, have an abortion. You don't think. It's when we start speaking right. that love, that truth in love, that people start to think. And that's what someone did for me. They actually humanized my child because I was going to abort my child. I had an appointment until someone humanized my child. And then I considered and I started thinking and I realized I actually have a baby. I know that sounds strange, yeah. but that's part of the education is that we are taught to act, not to think. And that's why it's such an easy decision for so many people to do, even though it destroys them. This is, I mean, it just is, it's wild that, that we've come this far and that we have, you know, taught people that it's okay for 10 year olds to be having orgies or sex or that it's okay for us to be killing our children. And I am so, so grateful to you for t sharing everything that you learn and kind of exposing it. I know that's an uncomfortable thing, probably, especially in the beginning when you had people who were your friends probably now hate you for it. Monica, where can people find you if they want to get in touch with you or follow you? You have a website and you also have our own social media. Tell us where we can find you. Um, so you can find me on Instagram at Monica Lial Klein. Um, you can go to it takes a or Monica Klein.com and definitely follow me on my podcast, the Monica Klein show. I talk a lot with experts around the country about what's happening in the schools and how we can strengthen our families. Absolutely. There is a war being waged on our children. Thank you so much for being here and helping us fight that war and equipping parents and telling us what we need to be aware of and how we can be fighting back. I'm so, so grateful for you. I cannot thank you enough. Thank you for joining us on Speak Out. It has been an absolute pleasure. Oh, thank you so much. And for all the work that you're doing as well, it's an honor to be here with you today.